How many of y'all have ever done a 1031 exchange? Anybody? Was it a painless process, pretty much? Oh yeah, you did use me. That's right, of course it was a painless process. All right, so we have an hour to get through a lot of information and odds are that y'all are gonna have questions that I may not be able to get through. So I'll try to leave time at the end for questions and if not, I'll just hang around afterwards if you've got individual situations that you wanna talk about because the more I'm doing this job, it's been four years now, I'm finding that um, it's not boring. I mean, everybody's situation is a little bit different and there's a lot of, oh, thank you. There's a lot of uh, creative ways to make all this work. For those of you that came in, if you're a realtor, come on up here and sign in. Okay, so this is the objective of our hour and this first question is geared to realtors. You're gonna know two simple questions that will tell you if the transaction is eligible for a 1031 exchange. My goal for you realtors is to know enough that you can tell your client about it. I had a guy call this week. Nobody told him about a 1031 exchange and he's facing a lot of gain. So the more education that we can get out there so that you can help your clients. The other thing is, is you're gonna look like a rock star realtors to your client then you're gonna get the listing on the replacement property, so you're gonna be able to multiply your commissions, and you're not dealing with somebody that has an emotional attachment to their property. You're dealing with an investors, and they're under the gun time-wise to find properties, so it really is a win-win for you. Um, we're gonna list and understand the six requirements for 1031 exchange. When you're dealing with the government, you always know they're gonna try to put you in a box. So it's not a big box, but it's a little box. Um, identify requirements for selecting a QI. QI stands for Qualified Intermediary. That's what um, ERG is. Recognize three common exchange problems and how to avoid them. And then recognize that 1031 tax deferred exchanges need to be a part of a client's tax planning strategies. My boss, Dan McCabe, has been doing exchanges for 45 years. We are based in Denver. He's an attorney, and this is his, one of his famous sayings. It's not what you make, it's what you get to keep that counts. Okay, so. Silly question, but you woke up this morning hoping and praying for a 1031 exchange to do. Probably not, but you're here, so thank you. False. 1031s are boring. False. A sale and a quick buy. Realtors, again, 1031s are a way for you to earn business from your competitors at the closing table. Okay. 1031 exchange starts on a sell. I have people call me after they sold and want to start it on a buy. It doesn't. It starts on the sell. That's important. It also involves a buy. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, we went over there. Okay, so key question number one. What was the property used for? 1031 exchange is uh, part of the IRS code and it's designed for properties that are used for trade, business, or investment. Today we're gonna talk about real estate. There are ways to do 1031s with fun things like musical instruments and airplanes and boats. If we have time at the end, I will tell you some fun stories about that. Key question number two is what will the money from the sale be used for? If you're selling real estate, you have to reinvest it in some kind of real estate. We'll go over the requirements. Okay, so there's six basic requirements. The property has to be held for trade, business, or investment. There is a, and I'll, we'll go into all these too. There's a 45 day identification rule. There's a 180 day rule. There are qualified intermediary requirements. There are title requirements. This is the one that's probably gonna make you the craziest. And then there's reinvestment requirements, equal or up rule. Okay, so the first one held for investment. 
The code defines it as any property held for income or used to produce income can be exchanged for investment or any income producing property. The code is not clear on how long you should own the property to qualify for long-term capital gains, but the standard answer in the industry is that you need to own it for a year and a day. Some people you will hear say two full calendar years. We don't because if you show it, if you, if you ever got audited and you could prove to the IRS that you had held it for a year and a day and showed it as an investment property in two separate tax returns, that should be, that is long enough. Does that make sense? Okay. So any property held for income or used to produce income can be exchanged for investment or any income producing property. Little known fact in Texas that oil and gas mineral rights are deemed as real estate. I don't know as if you want to buy them right now, although I think they're going up, but I had a lady a couple years ago, she sold all her oil and gas mineral rights and bought four duplexes with that. So rental property obviously is always an investment and bare land is always an investment because why else would you buy bare land? I don't think, if anybody has any other reasons, let me know. Okay, so here's an example. Dick and Jane own a duplex they bought in 2001, and they've rented it out ever since. They want to sell it and buy a condo at the beach to rent out to others and use a little bit themselves. Does this qualify for an exchange? Yes, it does. And the rule on, rental pro on vacation properties is generally 14 days you can use it yourself or 10% of the time that it's rented. Unless you have repairs to do and you figure out a way that you have to go make a trip and do some repairs. Hang on. Okay, so the first requirement is held for investment. The second requirement is the 45-day identification rule. So you have 45 calendar days from the date of sale to identify your replacement properties. The way that we do it is when you close, we send you a email packet and in there is a 45 day identification list. We don't need to see that list back for 45 days because you could look at 300 properties in that 45 days. But you do have to have your list nailed down by midnight on the 45th day. And that bottom one says there are absolutely no extensions, but interestingly enough, with all this flooding, um, we've been getting emails. There are, there are some extensions for people that identified replacement properties that are in flood zones. And obviously they can't buy the properties now because they're destroyed. So if that is you, or if you get in a situation like that, we've, um, we're getting emails every, uh, every couple days about the different counties. But that would be the only way there'd be an extension. So you can identify up to three different properties with an unlimited cap on the value. So that means, say you sold a $200,000 house, you could identify three properties at $5 million each if you wanted to and had the horsepower to be able to do it. If you go over three properties, then we get into a goofy rule called the 200% rule. And what that is, is you have to multiply the sales price of the house that's in the exchange times two. So say if the house you sold was 300,000, you multiply that times two. If you wanna identify more than three properties, then you have to list them all, add up the fair market value for all of them combined, and that cannot exceed the 200% of the sales price. And if I did good on the first go around on that, <laughs> it's the most confusing rule I think in this whole thing. So. If you're gonna do an exchange and if you wanna identify more than 300 properties, call me and we'll go through it again. Okay, so here is an example. Dick and Jane sell their rental for 100,000. They want to identify two or three replacements for 10 million each. Is this okay? It is okay, because it's under three. So one or two or three properties, there is no cap on the value. If you've got the financial horsepower to do it, then it is fine. But, 
same Dick and Jane, who are very active investors, sell a property on January 1st for 100,000. He wants to identify four replacement properties, four condominiums selling for 75,000 each. Is this okay? No, that's good. He could, but they could buy three of them because they would take that, um, no. Yeah, they could buy three of them. Take that 100,000 and times it times two, so their cap is gonna be 200,000. And 75 times three would be 225. So another option would be they could buy the, they could buy three of them and then they could do a cash out refi on, the, on one of them and take the cash out and then buy the fourth. So that would be another option, huh? If you identify more than three properties, the sum total of the value has to be less than 200% of the sales price. Oh, did I not add right? That's very possible. Well, um, yeah, the three could be, yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, if you buy three of them, it's fine, because it doesn't matter the value, but if he's gonna buy four of them, then it would be 300,000, would be the value, which would be more than 200% of the sales price. Okay, sorry about that, it's my math. Okay, so we okay on that? Three properties at unlimited value, more than three properties, 200% of the sales price for the total value. Okay, so now we go to the 180 day rule. And I don't think in this market that this is gonna be a problem with as fast as houses are going. The code requires that you purchase the replacement property by the 180th day after the closing of the old property. And it must be one or more properties on the 45 day list. So the 180 days includes the 45, so it's actually the 45 plus another 135. You can have properties under contract to buy even before you sell but you have to close on all the properties, finish the exchange by the 180 days, and that's 180 calendar days. IRS doesn't care if it's the last days on Christmas. They all have to be on the list. It's not good? Yeah, the purchase or purchases must be one of them on the list. Okay, so that's the 180 rule. Qualified intermediary requirements. All right, so the, obviously you have to use an independent third party that is required by the IRS. You should not use your CPA or attorney because of conflicting interests. Um, attorneys, they usually say if they've worked on your file for the last two years that you probably should not use them. Anybody can be a QI. We suggest you don't use your family members, your brother-in-law, they have a 16-year-old that gets in a car wreck while they're holding your money. That could be a problem. So you really need to use an independent third party. And they, and they must provide a qualified escrow account. I don't know if y'all remember when Land America in 2007 had to file bankruptcy, that was because of mismanagement of 1031 exchange funds for the most part. They held them internally and they commingled them and they leveraged them to buy options and when the market crashed, so did the company. So, yes sir? Of course, <laughs> that is someone like me. <laughs> Um, so what, anyway, what we do with your money, we don't hold your money internally. ERG has a great relationship, about a 40 year relationship with Fortis Private Bank in Denver. Dan has done business with them for years. So we actually open up a bank account for you. Your money does not stay with us internally and it requires three signatures for any money to be moved. It requires you as the client and ours in the banks. I'll get people calling me saying, Luann, I need money to be sent here for a down payment, and they realize I can't do that if they don't sign off on the wire form. So that is the safest way that we feel is the best way to hold your money. It's a segregated account, it's not commingled, 
and we set up a different segregated account number for every exchange that you do. Okay, so that's that. Title requirement, yes sir. Okay. Okay. No, that's a great question. So if you're selling domestically, you can buy domestically. If you're selling domestically, you can't buy in Canada. But if you're selling in Canada, you could buy in Cabo. So it's domestic, domestic to domestic or foreign to foreign. Make sense? Okay. And if they're coming out of New York, they probably have a whole lot more gain to pay than we do in Texas. Okay. Yeah, California and New York are winning the prize right now for the amount of tax. In California, does anybody have property in California? Okay. California is now t trying to chase down people after they sell a property in California and they do an exchange. You have to file a form, and this would be for you realtors if you do get any California clients. They have to file a form every year certifying that they are still, are still in the exchange, and if they ever cash out, then California wants their share. I don't know if they're ever going to be able to get it, but... Um, huh? How much is a share? I don't know. I don't know. I know what it is in, I know what our capital gains is in Texas. In Texas, generally what you're looking at is if your adjusted gross income is less than 400,000, it's 15% of your gain. If it's if your adjusted gross income is more than 400,000, then it's 20% federal and 4% health care. So you're looking at 24% plus any depreciation that you have taken while you've owned the property, that is all recaptured and then you're taxed on that as well. And, I, and that, that tax rate, I think, depends on your income level as well. So, and we're on the low end across the country. Yes, ma'am. Depends on how you hold the property. Yes. Double check that with your CPA. Okay. All right, this is from the code. In exchange was pursuant to an agreement the taxpayer transfers property held for productive use in trade or business or for investment and subsequently receives property to be held either for productive use in trade or business or investment. That is the IRS code. Okay, so here's the one that's going to cause y'all fits, I think. However, the taxpayer holds title. So if you own a rental property in your own taxpayer ID, then your own taxpayer ID has to buy the next property. Um, there are things called disregarded entities and single member LLCs. That can all be proven to be traced back to your own taxpayer ID. We would probably send you back to your CPA with that. I get a lot of people calling me saying, I want to sell in my taxpayer ID, but I want to buy in my LLC, especially if you're transitioning from single family to multifamily. And we need to address those situations individually, depending on how the taxes are paid. So. However, the tech, and then series LLC. Does anybody have a series LLC in here? Okay. That's a whole, that's a whole nother ball game as well. And there's only like seven states, I think, that allow them. Series LLCs, Texas being one of them. Okay. Sue is the only one on title of the rental house. She wants to add Fred to the title right before the sale. Can she? She can, but she's going to pay tax. <laughs> so it will be best for Sue to sell the rental house in her own taxpayer ID, go forward, buy the replacement property, and then add Fred to the title. And then they can own it together for another year and a day and move forward with an exchange. Does that make sense? OK. Okay, reinvestment requirements, equal or up rule. This is another one where there's a lot of misunderstanding. 
Okay. How many people think you just have to reinvest the amount of cash that comes out of an exchange? And it's okay to say it. Um, if you have a note on a property, we'll go back to an example. Say you're selling a property for 150000 and you have a note payoff for 75000 on that property. Once that note is paid off, the IRS looks at that as first dollar income to you. So your reinvestment goal to totally defer the taxes is going to be the amount of the note payoff. That's the debt relief showing up there, plus the net cash received at closing. So it's going to be a little bit less than the sales price because you get to deduct realtor commissions and title fees and our fee. Our fee is $750. It's a seller cost. And it includes the work done on the sale and the work done on one additional replacement property. And then we charge an additional 250 for each replacement property after the first one. But all that gets to come off the top. So you have a house for sale for 150, you're gonna pay what, 6% in commission and title fees. Odds are your reinvestment goal is gonna be somewhere around 140,000. Does that make sense? Okay, so a lot of people think they just have to reinvest the gain or reinvest the cash. It doesn't matter how you finance the balance on that, on that debt relief. If you want to bring in outside money and you don't want to take another note out and you can do that, then do it. It doesn't matter if you use hard money or conventional financing. You don't have to have a note the same value on the one that you're selling, but you do have to reinvest that total of the cash plus debt relief on one property or split up between two properties or three properties. So if you have 140,000 to reinvest, you could do two properties at 70,000 each. Use the cash for your deposit and finance the rest. It's the total outgo. Yes, sir? You have to use all the cash unless you wanna pay tax on what you don't use. But yes, you have to use the cash, yep. If you bring in the outside cash, sure. Yeah, you don't have to take a note out. If you've got the ability to do it, it's, that's a lot, it's, it's the amount. It's the amount, so again, if the IRS t ever took a look at your file, they would see, okay, he had $140,000 to reinvest. Did he reinvest that? Has anybody ever heard of tenant in common? Okay, so tenant in common are a great way to purchase um, properties if you're, if you're wanting to do a 1031 exchange. A tenant in common is where, say Fred wanted to own 50% of a building and James wanted to own another 50% of the building. You each go in under your own taxpayer ID, both show on the deed of trust, both take title, and then when you go to sell down the road, it doesn't limit you as far as what you individually could do. If you, and Fred and James are not getting along five years down the road and you wanna go different directions. With a tenant in common, you're able to do that. So it's a little bit more work going in, but it's a heck of a lot easier on the sale. And lenders, I think, are getting more comfortable with them. We do do a lot of talking to lenders with tenant in common just to structure them. Your smaller banks are a little bit more flexible with them, but that's a great way to set up a partnership. Yeah, that's what I just went over. I'm jumping ahead of this. Divorce issues, Dan's comment is if you're getting a divorce, you have issues. So if, if there is a divorce situation and the, the two parties are relatively in, in agreement, it makes a lot of sense to sell properties or, and go forward with an exchange and then divide up the assets after the fact. But each individual situation is different and we know it's touchy, so if you, realtors, if you have a client that, that, that you're involved with, call us and we'll address them one by one. Foreign owners, it's called FERPTA. And that is a special tax that needs to be with, withheld. We're not running into that too much. Does, has anybody ever heard of FERPTA? You have heard of FERPTA? Okay. You have, yeah. 
We ran into FERPTA, I think, with your guy. Yeah, we did. It wasn't too bad, though. No. Okay, so foreign owners, foreign owners on their um, reinvestment goal, they have a little bit of extra challenge. They have to equal or exceed the sale price on their reinvestment goal, and they must buy in the U.S. They don't get to take off the costs that we were talking about before, the net cash at closing, the realtor fees and the title fees. They have to buy equal or exceed the sale price. I'm not going to talk about owner carry notes. <laughs> we will, um, if, if you have a situation with an owner carry note, come see me and we will talk to Dan. Okay, so if you want to take money out of the exchange, that's called the boot. You have a $200,000 house, you want to take 50000 out to buy a Corvette. Well, no, Corvettes are more than that, I think, aren't they? To buy a new car, you don't have to put all the cash into the exchange. But any money that you do take out is going to be subject to the tax. So we kind of boot it out of the exchange, and then you boot whatever portion they tell you to the, to the IRS. But it's your money, so it's your call, what you want to do with it. Yeah, the impact on the exchange, it does not blow up the exchange. Okay. So if you're identifying potentials in a sale, two key questions, realtor, what was the property used for? If your clients say investment, that should trigger, have you ever thought about doing a 1031 exchange? What will the money from the sale be used for? They want to reinvest it in something for trade, business, or investment? That's a good, that's, those are the two most important questions. Okay, so sometimes we run into something called a consolidation exchange. You have several, um, say you have six rental houses and you find a small apartment building that you want to buy. And you want to use the money from all six of the rental houses to buy the apartment. You can do that. The, tri the tricky thing is if you're going to consolidate the funds from your exchange into one property, then you have to do it within 180 days. In this market, that may be possible, but that's something just to be aware of, that it has to occur within the 180 days. Diversification exchange is the exact opposite. You're selling a bigger property and you want to diversify and go buy smaller properties. Again, it all just has to be closed within the 180 days. Retirement needs, Dan, again, his favorite expression is defer, 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 and then die. <laughs> So, you, um, if you ever cash out of an exchange, then obviously there's going to be tax due, but if you can design it so that you pass it on to your heirs and then they inherit your property on a stepped up basis, they are never going to have to pay tax on it. So, it is a great retirement for you because you have passive, passive income coming in, obviously, or else we wouldn't all be here. Um, estate planning great for your heirs because they're never going to have to pay the tax on it. So it's something to think about. Maximizing investment yield, you're going to get a whole lot more bang for your buck doing real estate and exchanging and deferring taxes than you are, I think, in the market. Okay, so we're going to integrate it with estate planning. So you are mom and dad, and you own all this land. Let's say you own 200 acres of the farmland. This is actually a true story. You carve out a little bit for the house, and you stay in the house. But you say to your three kids, tell me what your dream is. Kid A over there, I think that's a bakery up on the top. Kid B is in a college town and wants um, a house to rent out. And then kid three just wants three rental houses. So mom and dad sell the land, except for the small part that they're keeping for their house. And they buy those three things. The kids rent them out, pay them rent so that they can live and then each year, and this, this is a story, 
they give back to the kids the amount that's allowed by the government for gifting. And then when they pass, so they have a lot more money to live on than they did when they were just owning the land. And then when they pass, the properties all pass on to their kids and the kids move on and they don't pay tax. That's one, that's one creative solution. Okay, so using exchanges to create permanent tax-free income. And this is better known as combining a 1031 exchange with the Section 121. Everybody knows what Section 121 is, right? When you sell your homestead, you're allowed, if you're single, you're allowed 250,000 exemption on any gain. If you're married, then you're allowed up to a half a million exemption on any gain. So, and this again is another true story. This is actually Dan's brother-in-law, though his name's not Dick. Dick and Jane have owned their home for many years and have a $1 million gain. This is a home in Colorado. How do they exit this property without owing any tax? Okay. So, what they do is they move out for a year and a day, and they rent it for a year and a day so they can do a 1031 exchange. And obviously, some of this is gonna be prorated. And then, the, make the sales price of 1.1 million, so they do a 1031 exchange for 600,000, they pull out a $500,000 boot, but since they owned it for two out of the past five years as their primary residence, that qualifies them for the Section 121, and since they're married, that qualifies them for the 500,000 exemption. So they are able to exit that gain with zero taxable. Do you see what, does that make, is that clear? Okay, how much time do I have? About 10 minutes, okay. So reverse exchanges, does anybody, everybody know what a reverse exchange is? It's a little bit more complicated. If you, say you found a property that you wanted to buy and you couldn't wait until you had time to sell the other properties. There is something called a reverse exchange where you would call us and we as your qualified intermedi intermediary would set up an LLC. We use Texas for an example, it's called an EAT. And we would work with your lender and we would purchase the property on your behalf. You would have exclusive right to buy and then you would have 180 days to sell the other properties that you wanted to use to buy this, and as you sold them, we would transfer percentage ownership to you, and then say on day 178, the whole, every, the whole deed, everything would be transferred to you. So there is a way to do that, as long as you think you can get your property sold in, a, in the 180 days. They're a little bit more expensive. They cost five or $6,000 to do because of all the legal work involved, but we've got a lot of people doing because people are finding a property that they want and they want it now and so they're willing to uh, to do it. They take about a week for us to get ready. Construction exchanges is the same thing. You want to buy something and build on it. Again, we can do it using the reverse exchange process. It's just that everything has to be finished in 180 days and that can be a little bit tricky. Improvement exchanges are basically the same thing as construction exchanges. Shifting the date of gain recognition. Sometimes you want to time the exchange so that it's in two different tax years. And that again is something you probably want to consult with your CPA and then we can figure that out. Integrating with estate planning, we just talked about that talked about combining 1031s to tax, to create permanent tax-free income. You always want to say defer tax with 1031 exchange unless you're talking about estate planning and then you can say permanent tax-free. Okay, so I will take questions in a minute. Judge Learned Hand, who is a real judge in West Texas, 
Um, anyone may so arrange his affairs that his taxes shall be as low as possible. He is not bound to choose that pattern which will best pay the treasury. There is not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. So we want you all to keep as much as you can <laughs> in your pocket and use it for investment. Yes, sir. How long have you leased out the previous house? Let's say it again, about 18 months? You should be fine. If you, so you wanna sell it and do a 1031 exchange? Do you have a good tax professional to double check that with? Do you have a good CPA to double check that with? Yeah, I would do that on something like that where you're not wanting to do an exchange. Yes, sir. What's the benefit of uh, identifying uh, multiple properties, three or four, if the first property already exceeds the cap? You don't have to. It's just your goals. Some people want to buy more properties to increase their passive income, but you can just do one. Well, and you could take, yeah, you could. And you could split up the cash that you have in your account and use the cash from your exchange for the down payments in the different, on the different houses so you, that you didn't have to come up with other funding. It really just depends on your goals. Anybody else? because they were using the section 121. So it had been their homestead for two out of the past five years. So they qualified for the section 121. Say it again. No, it was the 600,000 that they used for the exchange. But it was because they were a married couple, they could use that. You cannot exchange rental property for personal property, but you can exchange personal property for personal property. So I have a client in San Antonio, and he has done real estate, but he's also a member of the San Antonio Symphony, and he owns a cello, and that cello has increased in value. So we're getting ready to do an exchange with his cello. He's gonna sell his cello, and he can buy a bigger cello, sorry. Yeah, a cello, the musical instrument, a cello. So yes, but he has to buy a cello. You can do it with livestock, but if you sell a cow, you can't buy a bull. <laughs> if you sell a cow, you have to buy a cow. If you sell a bull, you have to buy a bull. Don't ask me why. You can do it with airplanes, but you can't go from a little prop plane to a big 747, each, each individual Personal property has its own limitations, but you could sell a small plane and buy another plane two or three classes up. Um, artwork, people have done exchanges with artwork. Boats, so yeah, it's uh, horse, race horses. I have not personally been involved in that, but Dan has, has told stories about race horses. So, but yeah, you can't go personal to real property. Mineral rights, mineral rights you can sell them by real estate. Because mineral rights in Texas are defined as real estate. Water rights are defined as real estate in Colorado. I, wind rights are defined as real estate in some states. So you really need to look at the definition of real estate in the state that you're wanting to buy. Texas, I think, might be wind, but I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't had somebody bring that to me. The only one that I've had is oil and gas. And we've, I've got people call me all the time that say, if, you know, if you've got exchangers that want to spend some money, we've got lots of oil and gas to sell you. So, anything else? Well, thank you all for staying awake. Oh, wait, one more.
Oh, owner financing. Okay, I can do owner financing. I just don't like it. So if you were going to do owner financing, you would have to pay off the balance of the note within the 180 days. Yeah. So you have to have, you could do it, but then somehow you would have to come up with the cash to pay off the owner financing within the 180 days. You doing your buy property on the one? You would have to pay off, you would have to have the financial wherewithal to pay off that balance within the 180 days. That's why I don't like it. But we get people that call and ask about it and most of the time it doesn't work out. But it, it's allowable. Anything else? Okay, if you, um, realtors, if you didn't sign in for the one hour MCE, come on up. And if anybody has any individual questions and they wanna um, stay and talk, we can do that too.